Good evening. Welcome to the John Adams Institute. My name is Tracy Metz. I'm the director of the Institute, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the day after an election event, not on the day of the elections, but the day after, in the hope that maybe we would already have a new president of the United States. As you know, we don't, but there is plenty to talk about. We are uh, organizing this event together with our partner, the Amsterdam Public Library, in their theater. This is one of the very last events, if not the last, to be held in this public venue, as government has decreed that uh, they have to close as of the end of this evening. So we're getting in just under the wire. It feels like everything happening right now is just under the wire. Although, having said that, we may not know till the end of this week who our new president is. But no matter, there's plenty to talk about. This evening, we decided to let the coronavirus work for us instead of against us. As most of you, I'm sure, know, we bring the best and the brightest of American thinking to the Netherlands, and that usually means that we have one American speaker. Given that nobody's coming to the Netherlands at the moment, we decided that this would be a good time to use all these new online possibilities to have five speakers for this evening to share their reflections with us on yesterday's events and what they see uh, coming up in the, the near and, of course, also the farther future. We have with us, as you see behind me, uh, a whole series of speakers, four of whom have already spoken before at the John Adams. So they're repeat visitors, and I'm very grateful to them for taking time on this busy and, and, and strange day to share their thoughts with us. One of the speakers is new, Arun Chowdhury. He is an American who lives in Berlin now and will be speaking with us about campaign strategies. We'll introduce him later on in the event. I would like to introduce to you now our moderators for this evening. First, Lila Frank, who is a journalist and writes about the US. And of course, Maarten van Rossum, also an expert on the US and um, one of the Netherlands' smartest people, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. I would like to uh, give the floor to them to tell you something about their experience of this election day and their first impressions. Lila. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the last dance, or at <laughs> least the last dance here in the library. Um, well, my impressions. It's been a strange ride, and if I have to tip in my five cents of wisdom on what happened tonight, let me reflect a little bit on what I'm seeing in the United States based on my travels and living there um, and on my recent travels as well. I see a great discomfort with America. There's a discomfort with the political system for many Americans where not every vote counts or not every vote counts equally. I, I see a great discomfort with the economic system, uh, growing income equality, just to mention one of the many things. I see a growing discomfort with structures of society, uh, racial disparities, debates about identity and diversity. Um, and I see a lot of distrust in institutions. And the discomfort translates to me into two different directions, one of them being activism. And we define that um, as a need or a cry for change. And I see apathy. Um, and if I reflect on activism, I see a need for change against the system in place, and that can translate into a vote, for example, for the president. Um, if you look at, at, at a vote a for, vote him, for him, him as a vote against the system, or, and it translates into a vote f uh, in the Hispanic community. Um, he has entered his way into the black community. Um, there are a lot of union members in Ohio that Trump took away from Biden. Um, a vote of activism, a protest vote is a vote for Bernie Sanders, for example. Um, and I also see a lot of grassroots activism. I see a lot of, especially in the South, activism growing, uh, trying to get people into the political system and educate them. And I see that actually as a, as a quite a positive thing. I also see a lot of apathy, um, not voting. So many Black Lives Matter protesters that I speak to who say, this system doesn't work for me, I don't vote. I put my body to the street, but I refuse to vote. Um, or I just vote this one time. We're all talking about this high turnout, which is true, but usually it's pretty shit. 
excuse my word. Um, um, and uh, voter turnout in the US is not that high, and I consider that a form of apathy as well. Um, and then there is just the fact that we don't talk politics anymore. Four years ago, people argued, and now they just gave up. Um, so when you look at the outcome of this, or well, outcome for what it is now, I see activism and apathy, and I'm not, and I'm not sure if it's gonna implode or explode. I think it's just a moment in time, and it's a very long stretch that we're living at, a stretch of change, a stretch of disparity, and honestly, I'm not sure where it's gonna end. I do see a little bright light, which is the activism, and I see a lot of negativity. But those are my five cents of wisdom for now. I guess it's so time to five, introduce Martin. Five minutes of wisdom. Um, True. <laughs> I got interested in the United States in the, in the 60s as a naive and young historian. My main inspiration then was um, The Making of the President 1960 by Theodore White. Wonderful book, uh, but full of mythology, of course, where you learn that Kennedy was a real hero, and of course Nixon was a terrible person. And by the way, they were almost exactly the same kind of person, they had the same kind of ideas. And I would say Kennedy was more sinful than Nixon in a certain sense, but anyway, I didn't know these things then. I was inspired by the book and I got interested actually in American presidential campaigns. And uh, my, my master thesis was about the beginnings of the Cold War, so I got interested in, in the history, the recent history of the United States. At first it was more of a hobby. And then in the course of the 70s, and especially I would say in the second half of the 70s, things started going wrong in the United States. You could start, if you wish, with the murder of John F. and the murders in 1968, a terrible year, fascinating year, but a terrible year, of course. But in the late 70s, I think far more structural things started going wrong. And if you think that, that uh, Donald Trump is the cause of all this misery in the United States, he isn't. He is a rather incompetent, we would say a varieté artist. He is whatever a varieté artist is in, in English, I don't know. He is a TV performer. In, in, he's he's a, actually a, quite a good TV performer. But he's not a good president, of course. But he's a symptom of something much deeper and much more structural. And that started with, symbolically at least, with Ronald Reagan. It had actually started earlier, but, but Ronald Reagan was the first sign, the first TV image of what was started, starting to go wrong. So it's 40 years ago that things started to go wrong in the United States. And that has to do with what we call neoliberalism, uh, the idea that uh, that the government should be as small as possible, uh, that investing by, by public institutions is the wrong thing to do, investment should always be something, something done by private uh, investors, of course, and then, of course, the, the, the great differences in income in the United States started uh, growing and growing and growing. Initially, Income differences in the United States were not as big as they were in Western Europe, especially in, in the, the, the worst parts of Western Europe, not as good as, Ger as Germany or the Netherlands or Sweden, but still. And now, of course, income differences in the United States are like Mexico or Brazil or Russia or China, whatever, they are terrible. And, and that, that is a thing that has terrible long-term effects on the whole social structure of the country. So, if I should come to a conclusion, mm -hmm. five minutes of wisdom, then it is, uh, it's kind of strange to say so. Uh, the United States has been a continuous big disappointment for me for the last 40 years of my life. Because it's an, an incredible rich na nation, it's a very vital nation in, in, in all kinds of aspects, but still, they don't do the right things. And it seems that the, the worst elements of American society seem to boss around that particular society. How come? Why, why is it that the United States went so far off the rails? It, it is now, I think, 
strangely enough, the United States was between 1945 and let's say 1975, it was an image that we were admiring. We were striving to become Americans in a sense. It was a great democracy, a wonderful working democracy, all, all poppycock, but still that's what we believed. And nowadays I think the United States is especially interesting if you want to know what can go wrong with a rich industrial nation. This is the most terrible negative development of any rich industrial nation over the last half century. We will discuss that. I hope that's wisdom. With. I'm not sure, but... Uh. <laughs> well, it's also a little bit of an abusive relationship, I would say, you have with the country. Because you keep having expectations. Oh, I, I keep have being disappointed. <laughs> Sometimes, some things in the United States I really do love. I mean, Boston is a great city, but then Boston is halfway between Europe and the United <laughs> States. It's not Omaha. And the same goes for Seattle, which has the same climate as the Netherlands. And, and because I think the Netherlands has the best climate in the world, Seattle also has the best climate in the world. If that's the best they bring... I think there should be more, and maybe we should bring in our... Let me, let me just oh. add one thing uh, before we go to our first speakers. I am here to field questions from the audience and pass them on to our moderators and to our speakers. So please feel free to send me your, uh, your observations and your questions, and I will duly uh, pass them on. Okay, so there's no raising your hand and asking a question, just no. to make it clear. Okay. Just the chat via the the digital channels. Okay, and you all know the digital channels? YouTube Live. Okay, well, there we go, YouTube Live. Okay, time to bring in our first panelists. Welcome to you both. Kim Wheely, expert on the US Constitution. Um, she writes books in a speed that Trump Twitters, and her last <laughs> book is What You Need to Know About Voting and Why. And we have Daniel Ziblett, Harvard professor of government and author of How Democracies Die. Welcome to the both of you. Um, let's just start with how are you feeling and, and what was your day like? Let me start with you, Kim. Uh, well, um, today's been crazy. I'm getting, you know, incessant calls from all over the world to talk about what happened yesterday and what the next steps are. But I feel a sort of a, a almost a calm compared to, to yesterday. Yesterday was definitely a difficult day. I feel like we're in the boat going down the river um, with half a paddle and we'll just have to see see where we end up. But, um, but the, your opening remarks certainly capture, uh, I think, you know, very well the, the sentiment in the United States, at least amongst, um, you know, the, the people that I think support some, some rule of law. And I, and I know we're in a moment where um, even saying that people should have access to the polls, even saying the Constitution should be respected, is perceived as political uh, over here. Um, but but some of us do want to just see American democracy back on track to some degree, which would require a Biden presidency. Uh, so it's a nail biter, no doubt about it. Um, but I'm so grateful for the opportunity to talk about this stuff um, in this kind of environment. Wonderful. And what about you, Daniel? What, what was your day like? What's your state of mind? Yeah, uh, very tired. Uh, but I, yeah, I agree with Kim. I mean, that's a nice uh, comparison going down the, the, the river with, uh, I mean, I th I, the comparison I was thinking of as I was trying to think of comments to make about the election, it was, it was sort of like being like a, being asked to comment on uh, how the patient is doing halfway through a surgery. I mean, hmm. we sort of don't quite know yet what the outcome is. And so it's hard to know exactly how to interpret things. But I do think, I do think it's really important, um, you know, the, the kind of the importance of being calm in this process. I mean, there's a great temptation because of social media and, and just the, the kind of heated rhetoric to um, overreact to things. I mean, that's certainly a, a lot at stake, but um, I'm trying to stay calm is basically the main message. <laughs> so asking you if we've seen democracy die a little more yesterday would not fit into that frame? Well, I no, I don't, I don't think we saw democracy die. I mean, I think in fact, it turns out, we, you know, the election has gone surprisingly smoothly. Um, you know, there had been reports, that, you know, journalists said, Report in the New York Times, there was an article last weekend saying, you know, there's going to be mass violence on election day, um, you know, all the stores were boarded up. And so this kind of created an atmosphere of, of the threat of violence. I mean, I think it is true, on the other hand, that, you know, having the, uh, President Trump last night at two in the morning, I was asleep, you know, saying that, oh, we're not going to 
count, you know, count all the votes. We'll bring it to the Supreme Court. I mean, he's really pushing the boundaries of what's uh, acceptable um, or be way beyond the boundaries of what's acceptable. So that's certainly very worrying. But, you know, this is just the latest uh, twist in a long story of degeneration, I would say, of our democratic institutions. I mean, I think and, and I guess one one thing I would say is that, you know, I had hoped that there would be a clear democratic, you know, I may be getting a little ahead of things here, but a clear democratic majority in the Senate, as well as a victory by Biden, which would have allowed for a major opportunity to carry out a whole set of democratic reforms. Um, and we can talk about what those are and what people yeah. think of those. But I mean, there was a real concrete agenda um, that a lot of people, that senators were talking about, that the Biden people were talking about. And I think all of that is now going to, in the best case scenario, which I think looks as if you know Biden is president and the Senate is Republican, which is like looks like it will be a likely outcome. All of that stuff will be put on hold. Yeah, we'll and talk about that. Go back to a kind of yeah, of, of a, kind of holding. Pattern. Yeah, should <clears throat> shouldn't be our first question. Why did such a terrible president do so well? Because he did unexpectedly well. We have to admit that. I mean, in seeing Florida gone, uh, you, you knew that it, that was a, a, a ter terrible experience for the next 24 hours or maybe the next week. And and who who had expected Trump to do so well? Can, can you can you imagine a man who has done almost everything wrong? that you can't do wrong, a man with a, with a kind of lunatic uh, uh, incompetence, and, and, and he is so extremely successful, um, never in, in American history for the last 120 years, so many people came to vote, and at least half of them voted for Donald Trump, for an idiot. Can you explain that? Kim, can you, can you go first? Sure. There's, I mean, that's a complicated question, and I know, um, <laughs> Daniel has some ex deep expertise on sort of the trends, why populism takes hold this way. Um, but a couple of things. First is, you know, yesterday was sort of counting um, only one team's votes in a lot of these states. And I, I blame, and I had a conversation, frankly, with CNN today. I said, listen, next round, when you put up a state and it says, oh, it's red and it's 56% of whatever, you need to educate the voters to understand this is as 56% of the votes that came in today in this particular state. We don't, there are millions of outstanding ballots that were voted by mail. Um, the expectation is they will be blue. If we had put those all in a bucket and waited for a month or a week and then counted them all at once, I think the, these trends would not look this way. And that's really unfortunate. And that's partly uh, not entirely the media's fault. They should have anticipated this, but it's just doing business as usual and not pivoting because nothing that's happening right now with Donald Trump is a surprise. Um, I mean, I had a piece yesterday in The Atlantic where I said, listen, he's going to call this election tonight and he's going to say we stop counting ballots, even if they're validly counted, uh, or they're validly cast. And there's not a law in the land anywhere in any state that says, ding, ding, the, the clock has rung. It's time to stop counting ballots. That That's, that's never the law anywhere. Um, but as far as you know, so I'm not so sure these numbers are so shocking. I never believed there would be this landslide. I'm not sure where people thought that. We're so polarized and we've tolerated so many horrific things. Um, kids in cages, uh, you know, shooting at, at, at uh, you know, the media, taking, you know, taking people's eyes out, you know, within the, uh, notwithstanding the First Amendment, uh, federal officers going after peaceful protesters, um, you know, impeachment without a trial. I mean, it just goes on and, and just the, the amount of corruption and using the office of the White House to, to make money. Uh, I, I, I just, we are, this is not that different from where we were a week or a month or a year ago. Um, as far as blame, a couple things. One is, of course, a lot more than the other networks combined, a lot of Americans get Americans get only their news from Fox News. Literally, that's it. And there's there's a slew of falsehoods, and the president supports all of that. So people believe lies that lies they don't understand. And with social media changing and and basically technology changing, I, I just had a, somebody in an Uber this morning. I was in the Czech Republic doing a, uh, the Czech embassy doing a talk. The Uber driver says, "How do you get good information?" I I think Americans need to understand how to manage the garbage in that it's not garbage. That needs to be taught in schools. 
And, uh, you know, when when you're told that I saved two million lives from COVID, I saved two million lives from COVID, I saved two million lives from COVID, that's what you believe. That becomes fact. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is, and this comes down to voting, you know, American America's, uh, and it sounds like Martin probably knows more about this historically than I do, but, you know, American dominance was built on putting people in chains for 400 years and sticking them in cotton fields to work as, as enslaved people. And uh, we still are having a, a fight in this country around uh, w- whether humanity is humanity. Um, and the, the ballot box is where one of those uh, fights are still happening. And so Donald Trump dialed in to deep-seated racism, to deep-seated misogyny, um, and to, to pain. You know, Americans, as Layla indicated, are in tremendous pain financially. Um, you know, you know they're, they're, they're the healthcare system, income inequality, uh, poverty. One in five children live below the poverty line or were hungry before the pandemic. That number went up, particularly among people of color uh, since the pandemic. And he dialed into easy answers to complex problems, which I know, again, Daniel can talk about um, as to, you know, uh, this populist sentiment, this is my savior. The, these are my, the, the propaganda feels okay. It also feels okay to marginalize other people based on skin color, based on gender. Um, I do think, I would hope that a populist message on the other end that had some threads into humanity could take hold as well. Um, but for a lot of sort of structural reasons Martin alluded to, the political system is deeply broken here. I 100% agree, it's it's very unfortunate that the Senate is not gonna function going forward. It's very unfortunate that um, that Mitch McConnell, who, who has endowed himself with single-handed veto authority that does not exist anywhere in the Constitution or anywhere in a law anywhere, um, is going to continue. And it's also unfortunate the Supreme Court has destroyed uh, the sort of campaign finance system such that People, the corporations and billionaires dominate our federal um, legislature. They, they're answering to those those constituents, not regular people. And I'll say the last piece is civic illiteracy in America. Um, the Annenberg Center for years, and I know I mentioned this in my talk last year, the sort of last moment of freedom before, before the pandemic when I came to, to Amsterdam and had an extraordinary time with all of you. Um, I probably mentioned after my first book, Annenberg Center for 10 years have done studies. Only a third of Americans can even name the three branches of government, legislative, judicial, and executive. Very difficult for them to understand why this matters so much, um, how to change the system, and, and that voting is so important. And this notion that unlimited power in the presidency is bad for everybody. Um, uh, uh, 10% of college graduates in 2015 thought the television reality star Judge Judy was on the United States Supreme Court. Um, Only six (laughs) states in the country require basic civic literacy as a requirement for high school diploma. So, I mean, I don't, I can't fix my car if if it doesn't start because I don't understand how the engine works. And to expect Americans to, to go in this very complex system, the electoral college, you know, you can vote people into office at the state level that will change the, the, the how the electors are actually casting their votes in the Electoral College to make it more proportional. Very few people understand that. They, they think, I mean, I have a daughter at Oberlin College. It's one of the sort of elite progressive institutions in the country. And she tells me that these students want anarchy. That's where they feel they want to throw the entire thing out. And I think even that, and they have professors that are that are encouraging anarchy. Um, I agree with Daniel, we need to take a deep breath. Uh, we need to just be calm. We need to wait for things to unfold. But to answer this question, it's very, very complicated, but it comes down in my mind to something I don't have expertise in, and that is psychology. The psychology of pain, that it's the psychology of easy answers and lies to complex problems has us in, in this very precarious moment of American democracy. Thank you. So let's switch to that breath of air. Daniel, if I, if I reframe Martin's question a little bit from uh, why do Americans choose Trump towards the problems that Kim just gave us, can you walk us through some solutions maybe, some optimistic views of uh, reparations of the Trump vote, if you will? Yeah. Well, I do think that I, I agree with Kim that one of the drivers of this, I think the sort of big, big force driving a lot of this is polarization. 
And what I mean by that is something very particular, which is the degree to which people in different political parties regard each other, not simply as rivals, but as enemies. So this is at the level of political elites and at the level of voters. And when you view the other side, not just as a rival who has a different view of the world, different you know, preferences about taxation and healthcare, but as somebody who, if in power, would fundamentally challenge your existence, then of course you'll go, if you, if you view your rival in those terms, then of course you'll go to extraordinary means to prevent them from getting into power. And once you're in power, preventing, you know, preventing them from, doing, from ever getting close to power. And so when we look at, at uh, President Trump's abuses and rhetorical kind of crossing the line, I mean, one of the most striking things is the degree to which Republican Party elites who presumably know better are willing to overlook these abuses and not publicly condemn them. I think that's a major facilitating factor behind what's happened. Um, and as well as I think voters, many voters regard the other side as so, such a fundamental threat that they're willing to overlook the, the, the abuses of democratic rules and norms uh, as displayed by President Trump and say, well, it's a, we don't like that part of what he does, but it's worth it because we so, so deeply dislike the other side. So the question then is how do you get out of that bind? And I think, I think the first step is to realize that it, you know, there's this concept that political scientists have of asymmetric polarization. Um, and this again, maybe sounds like a partisan statement, but I think the evidence is pretty clear that this radicalization has happened much more on the right side of the spectrum than the left side of the spectrum, at least among political elites. So if you compare congressional elites in, of the Democratic Party to uh, Republican elites, Republican elites have, much, have moved much further to the right. And there's lots of, the recent study came out by an organization called Varieties of Democracy, which shows this. So, so I think the first thing to cure is to figure out how to prevent, why is it that the Republican Party, which used to be a kind of very traditional center-right party, has become, in effect, a radical right party in the European sense? And how do you prevent that from, how do you kind of dial that back? And I think one of the things that, I mean, normally the way in politics, in political science, like in business, you know, if, if a party does poorly, if it doesn't do well, it has to go back to the drawing board and come up with a new strategy. Or just like a firm, if, it, if no customers come and buy shoes, you change the shoes you sell and you fire the manager or soccer team, you lose, you fire the coach, you get new players. The Republican Party has this interesting kind of dynamic where it's protected because of the nature of our constitutional system and the way that economic geography has developed. That is where people live, essentially. So another way to think about this is the Republican Party hasn't won a popular vote, including this year, uh, for the presidency in the last 20 years, except one time in 2004. And yet the Republican Party's held the presidency for 12 of those 20 years. <laughs> and so what that suggests is that you can lose and not try to appeal to voters in the middle and still gain power. And so there's a kind of buffer in place. There's a crutch in place, which reduces the incentive, the normal incentive for political parties to moderate and change their message. And in fact, given the kind of makeup of the party, there's a real pressure to double down and, and have an even harder, more right-wing ideology. And so in a way, these, insti so, so in particular, what I have in mind here are the Electoral College, uh, which overrepresents rural areas. That's always been the case in our political system. But what's unique now is that because of where people live in residential patterns, this rural overrepresentation means Republicans are overrepresented. They get this extra artificial boost in the Electoral College, as well as in the US Senate, because you know, each state has two representatives, no matter the size. And so as a result of this, the Republican Party is overrepresented in the Senate, which then also means the Supreme Court, which is selected by the president, selected through the Electoral College, confirmed by the Senate, also has this extra boost. So there's this kind of system of protection in place. And so in terms of what can be done about this, this is why I think it's, I mean, I'm not only interested in democratic reform because uh, things such as getting rid of the Electoral College or maybe getting rid of the filibuster or adding states to the U.S. to the U.S. Sense. So the District of Columbia uh, could be a, uh, made a U.S. state. Puerto Rico could be made a U.S. state. These would be all democratizing reform, protecting the right to vote, uh, increasing increasing the number, making it easier to vote, same day register, automatic voter registration, easier mail and voting, a bit of what we experienced this year. All of these kinds of reforms that allow the majority to speak, allow the majority that's actually there to speak, not only would we be democratizing, they would also reduce the protections that are in place that are allowing the Republican Party to compete, not win and still gain power. They would have to compete in a real marketplace. And that would, I think, have a de-radicalizing effect on our political system. And do you see a real movement towards those changes? 
Well, th again, this is what's a little bit tragic, I would say, about this election. Absolutely, there's a movement. The, and the, the members of the U.S. Senate are discussing this. Democratic members of the U.S. Senate are, are want to get rid of the filibuster. They, there's a bill, H.R. 1, House Resolution 1, which was passed by the House of Representatives, Democratic House of Representatives in, uh, in 2019 that was never passed in the U.S. The Senate when, because it was under Republican control, which allowed for same-day or automatic voter registration. There was one proposal to make voting a national holiday, campaign finance regulation. There's all, a whole series of reforms. The problem is that given the current makeup of the government, as it appears it'll be coming into existence in January, none of this stuff is going to go anywhere. Did you want to ask something? Uh, well, I have two questions. Well, the first question, of course, is uh, the United States political system and the United States in general are dominated by a minority party. The minority party dominates the majority and dominates the whole country. And, of course, it does that on the basis of a very strange political system which was designed in the late 18th century and doesn't fit the present situation at all. But of course the minority which is dominating the system is not willing to change the system because it profits from the fact that the minority is the majority actually, which is a strange situation, but that is the situation. And one of the other points in the United States, if you've ever been to the United States, you know that there is something deeply wrong with the United States and many Americans because the United States is a kind of self-congratulatory society. It's always the greatest nation on earth. It's always a shining city upon a hill. It's always God's own country. If you don't say goodbye to the mythology of your own nation, you will keep on doing things wrong, is my opinion. But what's First, your people have to believe that lots and lots of things are completely wrong in the United States. Can I phrase this into a question? Sure. Or can you phrase thought, it into a question? I thought it, I thought it was a question. But, but Did the, you? the question is, how come that in, in lots of Western European countries, we have a far more realistic picture of our own country? Maybe because of our very small countries, we have never dominated the world and so forth and so on, but still we have a more realistic picture of our countries. By the way, can I say something about your book, How, how Democracies Die, which I read a I think two years ago. It, it, quite an interesting book and, and interesting for, for, the, for signaling the problems that can go wrong. But you, you don't write anything meaningful about the little Western European democracies, which actually are the best functioning democracies in the world. And there's nothing wrong with these small democracies. They, they're still functioning very well. There's lots of things wrong with the United States or with <laughs> Russia or with Turkey or whatever but not with Denmark or, or the Netherlands or Sweden or what have you. Daniel, I'm going to invite you to answer that question on the side with Martin, if you don't mind, because I also want to, sorry, Martin, uh, I also want to address, I think, one of the urgent questions that the Dutch audience also has when it comes to Donald Trump and his claim that he's going to go to the Supreme Court and that he wants to file all those suits. And Kim, I'd like to ask you, can he actually do that? Or what is the real... Uh, is there a real threat and a real possibility that the president will go there and what would it look like? Yeah, well, I think there's a hundred percent chance that there will be lawsuits filed um, depending on the outcome of these swing states that Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Lips, maybe North Lips. Carolina. Um, it's okay. And so the step, the first step is to identify if there's a delta that is narrow enough um, to justify a contest. When I say justify, as a threshold matter to get into court, uh, the president would have to show that if he wins the case, he would get some kind of benefit from it. So if, if, to, if, if uh, Biden were to win by such a huge margin that it wouldn't change the race anyway, a lower court probably wouldn't even hear the case. So that's number one. We just have to wait and see. Uh, what if, if Biden does win, if he wins by narrow margins and, and it's the narrow margin that screws up the electoral college and the popular vote. I mean, it's these, na the narrow margins that get us into a lot of trouble. Um, so that's number one. If, if it happens that that's the case, there's absolutely zero doubt in my mind and presence already indicated it from even before yesterday that there will be lawsuits There are hundreds of them filed 
before yesterday. It's record numbers, challenging everything from uh, additional drop boxes for during a pandemic to drive through voting to signature requirements to lifting notarization requirements. I mean, remember, you know, it, it depends on the state. Your right to vote, unlike other constitutional rights in the United States, it hinges on your zip code. If you your First Amendment rights are consistent across the country, um, but not when it comes to the right to vote. So I think then the Trump's lawyers will scour, scour the law, scour the the polling stations to find whatever particular in, in abnormalities they can drum up. Um, I mean, there might be some legitimate problems, uh, but I'm saying, I, but I, you know, in my mind, the right to vote should outweigh of these, these, but that's not how our constitution works under this current Supreme Court or how the Supreme Court is construed the right to vote, which is not expressed in the constitution. Um, so then they would have to, they'd have to then bring a viable claim under state law. Then they would have to convince the Supreme Court to take expedited review. Normally this will take months and months. You have to file in the lower court. Then it would have to go to an appeal. Then it might go to what we call an in-bank at the appellate level where the entire circuit would listen to it. Then it would go to the court. So this conservative court's been very eager to grab these cases on expedited review. So my guess is they would take it. Then it would come down as a legal matter to essentially what is, this is my view, the source of the change. So under the constitution, the textualists on the conservative court have taken the position that when you're talking about elections under the elections clause, only if the legislature actually makes the change at the state level to, for example, allow uh, mail-in ballots to be counted uh, after election day, um, if they were received or postmarked, I should say, prior to election day. If that change was made by the state legislature, then it's good. If the change was made by some other entity, a judge, under the state or federal constitution, a secretary of state or elections official um, under the basically delegated power by the legislature. The conservatives, I think, and a majority would say, no, 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 that's not legal. And then would allow votes to literally be canceled out um, on this theory that we're textualists. And I put this in quotes, I can talk about this at length. I think You know, textualism is a real approach to constitutional uh, theory, as is originalism. It just isn't black and white. That's the fallacy, the notion that there's no judgment or discretion. So I think then it'll come down to that if it turns out that this change is something that is embedded in state law or was pre-existing to the pandemic. I think even the conservatives are going to have to allow Joe Biden to be president. So we just don't know right now. It, all of these facts have to line up in a way um, that puts before the court a change that would sway the election for Donald Trump that wasn't based on an actual statute, of a state statute. If, if those things come at all align, then I do think the court would have no problem giving the election to Donald Trump the way it did in 2000 to George Bush. I think I understand you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm trying to understand how big, how how real this opportunity is that we're gonna get stuck into months of lawsuits before we actually know what the outcome of the election is. is that, I think that is, is unlikely. Is, it, is, it, is, it, is it not a typical American problem? All these idiot, I, idiotic I, I just, lawsuits, lawsuits about everything, everywhere, every time, by every person. You are you are a. a, a, a a dictatorial state by lawyers, in a way. Well, I mean, I'm well, a law I'm, professor, I'm so still, I'm, I'm, sort of I'm trying to look for structural reasons that so many things go wrong in the United States. We have uh, breaking news, Martin. Oh, Martin, that's me in this case. Uh, no. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm totally confused. Yeah, we just it just got in that Trump is asking for a recount in Wisconsin. Um, pretty much all the votes are counted. Joe Biden is leading, small, small margin. Uh, Kim, is this, is there a law in place in Wisconsin, a formal law that says when you can recount or not? Is this a yes, real option? Yes, there is, and I actually have the research. I'd have to pull it up. Um, I don't have it off the top of my head. Some states, there needs to be a certain delta or, you know, it needs to be cl- a very close vote. Some states, you can just ask for a recount automatically uh, a candidate or a voter. So it's going to depend 
on the law of that state. My guess is Trump's lawyers feel that Wisconsin gives them some room. Uh, and so to answer your question, Layla, just because they're asking for a recount doesn't mean that we're going to end up in the Supreme Court. I mean, that's the part that I just think we really need, not you, but in general, to slow it way down. The chances of that happening are slim. And one thing that I think is a really positive thing is the fact that yesterday went smoothly. I have more confidence in, you know, the people on the front lines of democracy, right? I try to say this when I get on air in the United States. Listen, these are not fraudsters. These are not terrible people that are trying to steal elections. These are hardworking, you know, people with integrity that are running these elections with a hand tied behind their back, you know, without enough money in a pandemic. And I think they know they're ready. Wisconsin's probably ready to do this recount. And if, if the legal challenge is slim, if the legal challenge is on some very thin read, I don't think it's going to get to the Supreme Court. I, I really don't. Courts know how to do this. And what we've seen with a lot of the litigation, I mean, like as Martin said, lawyers file these lawsuits, but I teach civil procedure. A lot of, they can get thrown out. If the challenge is fraud, what we've seen so far, if the Trump admitted campaign comes in and says, fraud, 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 they see this all the time on, you know, Twitter, the judge will say, give me the facts and the evidence. That's the moment of truth. They don't have it. Um, so with, unless they can come in with witnesses, documents, proof of fraud, then the voter will win. The vote will be counted. And so that's, that's really going to be at the, even the lower court level. If you can't come up with something, bye-bye, dismiss your complaint. Okay. So I take this as an optimistic note, actually. Um, Daniel, too, I think uh, we're almost there. What makes you keep your calm and... Uh, can you give us a positive note on what you've seen over the last 24 hours and what you're expecting for the next? Meditation. No. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I, I do think, I mean, this is really important. I mean, this comes back to Martin's point. We have to remember a majority of Americans have never supported Donald Trump. They, they never supported him in 2016. They didn't support him in 2020. In the four years between 2016 and 2020, at no point did he ever have anything approaching 50% approval ratings. A majority of Americans are liberal, inclusive, embracing of multicultural. I think, you know, you look at the public attitudes towards the Black Lives uh, Matters protests, a majority of whites supported the Black Lives uh, Matter protests. This is a major change from 1968 when Richard Nixon was able to call upon the, his law and order strategy to kind of mobilize whites. This is no longer the case. American society has transformed. The problem is this majority is not in power and we have a political system. I mean, it's a little bit like trying to get to the moon with the Wright brothers airplane. I and mean, we have a constitutional structure, a voting system that, that Kim is describing that in any established democracy would be an embarrassment. It's, it's highly decent. I mean, there are heroes at the front lines doing this important work as Kim describes, but the fact that we need heroes to make our election system work is a problem. We, I mean, so we're working with a very old fashioned 18th century structure. Um, the majority, of, so, I, so I, I blame our institutions, not our people. And so the question is how to reform our institutions. And so, I, so that, that's what gives me some confidence. All right. Perhaps one uh, 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 last remark that I'd like to ask you both to uh, uh, respond to. What we've seen now is an extraordinary turnout. And that's a good thing. That's a positive note on these historic elections. Do you see that turnout as an expression of heightened engagement by Americans in the political system uh, running their lives? Or do you see it as a sad expression of the increased polarization? Well, I mean, I think it's the former, personally. I, I you know, we went, I don't know what the numbers are now, but it was approximately 50%. I, you know, Americans are learning about their government. They're learning about how their the voting system works. They, and that they it matters. Know, and that it matters. I mean, that, you know, that that I think is wonderful. I hope the conversation continues. I think the concern is, okay, now we are here. We have a minority in power. What do we do next? Um, throughout impeachment, the, the Republicans were like, let, let the voters decide, let the voters decide. Now we're not letting the voters decide. Um, and so really it's, what do we do now? As I mentioned, you know, you know, young people saying we need anarchy. Uh, that that's really the challenge. If it can't be at the ballot box, you have to change the system. If you can't change the system at the ballot box, how do you how do you change the system? But I actually think 
the turnout is is a really bright light, and I hope that carries through to civic engagement between elections, not just on election day. Mm -hmm. Daniel, for the final words on this. Yeah, yeah, I would say it's both. I mean, that's the nature of polarization is that it's a double-edged sword. Polariz I mean, we need polarization. We need vehement you know, disagreement in a democracy. That's what democracy is about. But on the other hand, extreme polarization can kill democracies. And so, you know, we're witnessing both at the same time. And so that, you know, this is, this is why we need to, in a way, channel this in a way that allows our institutions to cope with these kinds of uh, ch challenges. Thank you so much. Daniel Ziblet, I think you're going to leave us. Have a wonderful yes. rest of, well, however long it's going to take. Uh, Kim yeah. is going to stay with us for a while. Uh, feel free to tap in, uh, Kim. And thank you both for this conversation. Um, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. We are going on. We have, I think we have Arun on the line. Do we? Is technology? Yes, I, yes, there we go. Um, Arun Chaudhry, welcome. Um, you're actually a first time speaker here at the John Adams, so we're very happy to welcome you. Arun uh, is a campaign advisor, American abroad in Berlin, a new European. Um, he was President Obama's videographer and he was a creative digital director for the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016. What's your state of mind? I mean, it kind of ended up like a lot of us thought it would, much closer than it should. Uh, and for sort of bright, obvious tactical reasons that I think should be something that the Democratic Party has soul searching about. Uh, I mean, what you saw, uh, what you see unfolding is Republicans voting for Republicans, right? Like, which sounds like a simple thing, but the Democratic Party has spent so long courting them, inviting them into their convention, uh, making sure they know there's a place for them in the cabinet in a way that no other center left party in the world does, right? Like, or, or normally would. And so I hope this sort of fever dream has been broken by the Democrats and they'll look actually to folks in their own party, especially in the progressive wing. Uh, to bolster their chances of winning elections. Huh. But if you look at it, I, I mean, if you look at it from that point of view, has the Democratic Party learned anything since 2016 when you look at the outcome right now? No. I mean, you saw what running the exact same campaign got almost the exact same results. Joe Biden, of course, is doing better, especially with working class whites in some places that is particularly useful. But, but again, I mean... Without COVID, I think we would imagine Donald Trump with an extreme uh, electoral college victory uh, in a landscape like this. And it has to be puzzling at a time when his leadership has so obviously failed in the time of COVID and has so obviously led to deaths of his direct constituents, the people he needs the most. Like, you know, old folks in Texas are not who, as a campaign advisor, I would tell Donald Trump to put on his kill list. <laughs> so... <laughs> He should have hired you. Um, yeah, really, you know? <laughs> can you walk us through the biggest takeaways for you from the outcome or the results that we know right now? Yeah, you know, it's that we, ha we had a really good thing going this time in terms of, like, pure science of campaigning because so many things you couldn't do that you would normally do. So now you find out if they work or not. And so many other things, you know, that you go through the motions on. And I think the thing that we have to ask ourselves is how effective are campaigns to begin with even? Like the biggest takeaway from the Democratic primary would have been that, you know, 20 candidates who all had state-of-the-art digital programs, let's say 10 of them had state-of-the-art <laughs> digital programs, but that's still an awful lot, um, were not able to overcome a candidate who had just a bigger relationship with the media and with the public. Uh, and so the kind of, the idea that elections and primaries are sort of these even playing fields that two teams go out rather than a very uneven playing field where there's already a story being told uh, and that it's really important to, to keep telling those stories outside of the election. You know, Donald Trump has been running from the very first day he took office. And I mean that quite literally, he filed his fundraising paperwork right hours after his inauguration, which is a bit of an odd duck maneuver. Uh, but I think he meant it quite seriously. He's been spending real time campaigning, talking to people, uh, you know, holding these, these immense rallies. And it has increased his voters uh, and increased his voter turnout. And it has a bit of the kind of Karl Rove energy of, you know, you increase your, you go find new voters that look like you. You don't increase the size of the tent. You just 
in a country where 40% of people aren't participating, the biggest untapped resource you have is, uh, is non-voters, is people who don't vote. And unfortunately, a lot of the digital tools we have are meant to turn out likely voters. And these new Trump voters would have definitely been classified in anyone's, you know, little digital playbook as being low propensity voters. And so in an election where you're not just going door to door and talking to everyone, but are actually targeting people digitally online, you're going to just miss all of those people. Hmm. So where is the Democratic Party at right now? Let's say Biden wins, just for the sake of argument. And I think it's likely he will. Right. Uh, we hope and expect that, that, that Biden will win. Uh, I think the Democrats then are, are going to have a very awkward couple of months. Um, probably the biggest regret progressives have is not pushing Obama during transition. You know, the old adage personnel is policy. But I think people thought, oh, we've elected this guy, you know, no matter who the cabinet is, who cares who these things are, like, you know, he's the one making the decisions. And I think as someone who got to work at the White House, I saw how... Uh, who the people in your cabinet are, the people who recommend your policy positions to you, kind of can, can constrain the arguments. And so I think you'll see a lot more jockeying and pushing for different actual personalities for some of these positions, where in the past you kind of would have taken a step back and, and not really started pressuring the, the new government until it took office. So I think you'll see Biden-Harris administration sort of taking a lot of incoming from the left immediately uh, after he's declared the winner. So there's going to be a big influence from the progressive wing, that's what you're saying, basically. Yeah, and, and I would say this is the same as we're seeing in a lot of places, whether it be uh, the, the re latest regional elections in, uh, in Italy or, uh, or in the U.S., you see progressives and young people kind of coming out and towing the line for candidates who may not have been their first choice and not necessarily getting a lot in return. And I think that that's fine for the time being, but eventually there's a bill to pay uh, and kind of not winning big and doing sort of disappointingly, not keeping the Senate uh, makes Democrats, especially traditional Democrats who've been pushing this very vulnerable to new voices within the party. Hmm. Bernie Sanders would be happy. Martin. Yeah, shouldn't we give Trump his due? You said just that he started campaigning on the first day of his presidency. And whatever we think of him, he is a great campaigner. Absolutely. He campaigned for four years. He did everything wrong that a president can do wrong. And, and, and see how he came out with flying colors in a way. Let's hope that Biden wins. It's an unsure thing at the moment. So, uh, so what's, your what, what, what's so special about his, uh, his campaigning? It, it's what, not the, even what, does, campaign what does he do that he was able to... to uh, to have all these Latinos vote for him. What did he do? And he, what, was, yeah. he was always completely negative about Latinos. And also, what did the Democratic Party didn't do in addition to that? I mean, I, I spend a lot of time watching Trump rallies. He's someone who I find fascinating, fascinating and talented. I, I don't necessarily think he is like a genius. Uh, I don't even think he's necessarily very clever. But he's, uh, I think the English word that I would use is canny. And he has an intent up and he knows what's going on. And like Napoleon, he, you know, he, the thing he excels at is picking the battlefield he wants to win at. So, you know, you invite him into a debate about one thing. He's going to talk about what he wants to talk about until that becomes the subject because he knows he can win on that. Uh, I think in a situation without COVID, like I said, you would find him with a massive, massive victory. Uh, and even with COVID, it kind of cut off his ability to change the subject from the thing he was doing the worst at, which was COVID. So uh, this definitely was sort of the thing I think that prevented him from just clearly running the table. But what he does is he crystallizes, a I call it jazz. He's out there. The things don't necessarily make sense. If you listen to one, it may sound ridiculous to you. But if you watch a whole two hour event, he paints a picture that has a very simple message and that it's very easy for him to fulfill, which is prove them wrong. You know, it's just prove them wrong. Who? Everyone. The experts, the economists, you know, your teachers, everyone. Prove them all wrong. Uh, and this is why you can have a, a policy that's absolutely contrarian to the interests of someone who's voting for them because they're not interested in the policy. They're interested in the trajectory of that policy, which is to constantly prove that the elites are wrong. And Donald Trump does this with his very existence. 
his existence seems to infuriate, especially, you know, uh, liberal folks in America uh, to the point that he can actually steer the conversation at all times. So it's not something anyone can do. It's not something anyone can do. He actually is, I think, in some ways, a very special candidate. Arun, why is this message of proving them wrong such a strong appeal to voters? What's what's beneath that? I think especially on the left, you know, sort of after the New Deal and the kind of erosion of it, you saw what was a mass party. And I think you can make analogies to many of the European center left parties. What was a mass party became a professional party, a party of professionals. Uh, and, and at some point, the community and the family that it, it, that it offered to people disappear. And this sort of sense uh, that they're absolutely not looking out for the best interests of people while still sort of taking the votes for granted, just the difference in, in the rhetoric versus the action has just left a debt uh, that has to be paid. And I think austerity, uh, especially is kind of influenced by the, by, by the Germans in the EU, uh, was sort of the last straw when it was sort of suggested that the working class was going to have to pay the debts of the upper middle class and the rich. And this broke a, a worldwide straw in which people no longer saw themselves as part of a bigger cosmopolitan project. And, and it really is going to take a lot of national reconstruction to sort of set that right. What can the Democrats learn from Trump's campaign talents around? You know, I, I think one of the things that they and can I'm learn... And I'm asking this, I have a reason for asking this. Lila didn't mention it yet in her introduction, but you were also uh, advising the Dutch Labour Party, the PvdA, uh, on our upcoming elections in March. So I'm very curious, uh, what can we, the Dutch, but also what can the Democrats learn from uh, uh, Trump's uh, um, blunt but passionate and effective campaign strategies? In some ways, it really is about back to the basics, about what's on offer. It's what should I expect from the government and what will I get and should I want more? Trump hasn't delivered on those things necessarily, but that was an important part of his rhetoric and continues to be. You know, he seems to, from our perspective inside the U.S., be the one who's pushing to get stimulus checks out, be the one who kind of kind of one who wants to get you uh, influx uh, of something to help you in your life. And, and so this... Uh, idea that it's less about sort of the decency and the presentation and all these things, and it's more what you give and what you get is something that Donald Trump... Transactional. Yeah, lives and breathes in this sort of negative way to some people who don't like it and a positive way for people who do like it. But everyone can take something from this and that people want you to approach them with a genuine offer, not just with the sort of set of attitudes you're supposed to have. Because that is what a lot of people say about Trump, who are in favor of him. Um, he's delivered. He does what he says. He does what he promises. I mean, if you're interested, for instance, in conservative judges, he has been working overtime to get you, you know, more of them uh, than anyone since George Washington managed to appoint. Is the whole idea of what a government can do for you and what you can expect from a government, is that... Um, over, it, do the Democrats overstretch that idea for an American uh, framework? I think the Democrats have been so scared of it as part of an American framework for so long that they didn't notice that Republicans, especially through people, uh, outsiders like Steve Bannon in 2016, had snuck up on them. You know, there are many ways in which you could say Donald Trump ran to the left of Hillary Clinton very successfully in 2016, maybe much less in 2020. Uh, but actually, you know, crept in around the edges. Because in America, our politics aren't based on policies. They're based on, again, sort of teams and postures and attitudes. And I, and I would point you to 2016 again, in which Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump essentially traded positions of the parties, right? Hillary Clinton was pro-intervention and pro-free trade. Donald Trump was anti-intervention and pro-protection. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is the opposite of their parties, and no one sort of minded. This didn't cause a mass defection of voters because they're still your team and you vote for your team. We have a question from Paul Soltis who says, I don't understand your claim that President Trump is a great campaigner. Are you suggesting that Joe Biden should lie more often? Uh, Joe Biden... Uh, 
is not as good a campaigner as Donald Trump. Both of them generally enjoy being in crowds and talking to people. And I, I don't but I don't think it's about the lies that Donald Trump says. I think it's that he is the embodying his message. You know, everything he says, if he's like, ah, these people are lying, CNN, they're horrible, lock them up, whatever, is part of this prove them wrong message. The problem with Joe Biden is that he has problem um, sort of taking the things he wants to do and making them into a catchy, short message that you can go to a rally and come away with a profound understanding of what Joe Biden is going to do for you. I, I, you know, I, I say this as someone who likes Joe Biden quite a bit, but his strength is in sort of empathy and compassion and, again, sort of attitude and posture. He knows his stuff on policy, but he is not a great synthesizer. He is not Bill Clinton. Yeah. He is not, not short Obama. and snappy. What would his logo be on his cap if it's a MAGA, Make America Great Again for uh, Trump? What should Biden's logo be on his cap? <laughs> no more malarkey. <laughs> uh, look, Joe Biden has a real chance to have a third act and reinvent himself again. I think we have already forgotten that Joe Biden of 2008 was a fairly conservative senator uh, you know, who was for, had been very strongly for the Iraq war, was sort of the antithesis of what Barack Obama represented in so many ways. And that they're coming together wasn't a buddy cop movie. It was an odd couple sitcom, right? Like this was uh, the kind of coming together and sort of reinventing himself as Barack Obama's vice president, as someone who was more advanced on social issues, who was, you know, sort of coming around even on some of his more conservative ideas uh, was interesting. I think he has that opportunity again to decide that he wants to be more than that and to bring the Democratic Party together. I worry that with this sort of um, meager, slightly pyrrhic victory, uh, maybe, it, maybe it can become more than that, but he is not going to feel like he has the mandate to sort of become uh, uh, the transformational figure that I think Democrats really need. Hmm. Uh, yeah, let's go. Let's come back to the stru structural problems. You said uh, that that uh, the mistake that the Democrats made are the same mistakes that social democracy made in Western Europe. I think that's quite true. Uh, these mistakes started quite early in the 70s and have all to do with the fact that social democracy failed in compensating for deindustrialization that happened in the United States in a big way and in a little bit smaller way in Europe. But the, the, the under 30, the, the, the last, the deepest 30% of the population is, wasn't helped by the Democrats in the United States or the Social Democrats in Western Europe. They left the last 30% of the population there, struggling. That's what it is, struggling. Mm -hmm because their, their incomes didn't rise for about 30 to 40 years. That's the start of all the problems of the left in the last 40 years, I think. Mm -hmm. And certainly the problem with Democrats in the United States, which have been collaborating with the Republicans for a very long time. Was there a question? Yes, that's a question. And because the question is, what are they going to do about that? And as far as I know, the, the Senate will remain in Republican hands. That means that nothing is going to happen in the next four years. Another four years lost to do the things that should be done. That is exactly the question. That. Aron, I'd like to add a question that just came in from the audience that mm -hmm. uh, uh, dovetails with this perfectly. Stephen from the Verif, wouldn't you say that the Lincoln Project, founded by Republicans and openly speaking out against Trump and for Biden is a telltale sign that even some Republicans think that things need to change. No. Oh. Lincoln Project is not an example of that. Sorry, Lincoln Mr. Project, Lincoln Project is an example of uh, simple grift and theft uh, by political consultants. Um, if what they were doing was effective at all, you would have seen you would not have seen the results you saw last night. Republicans voted for Republicans wanted to vote for uh, a certain segment of the Washington Republican class uh, who seemed to be unusually uh, bellicose on foreign policy, seemed to be dissatisfied with the performance of the president and seemed to have a private vendetta uh, and managed to spend $70 million of Democrats' money on it. So I'm very sour on the Lincoln Project uh, and I, I'm very glad that 
their kind of model has been disproven. Although I think the damage will go on because they have now the data of moderate Democrats in places like Texas and Georgia, uh, and they're clearly going to try to flip that back for Republicans. Um, but what, what I do think, and, and you saw a little bit in the election, um, look, every political party is, a, it, it, it is amassing of groups who don't necessarily get along, uh, especially in a system like the, the Brits or the Americans where you have the kind of the, the two party system more. Uh, you know, the Republicans have a strange alliance of sort of like hedonistic rich people and, like, you know, poor evangelicals. Uh, the, the, the Democrats have like Silicon Valley and labor. Um, but this is where I think you need to make sure everyone in the tent is empowered in some way. And part of what you saw with the process described over the last 40 years is the diminishing of the power of labor, diminishing the power of labor. Uh, coupled with the fact that we only had envisioned a labor movement around industrial things. And so interestingly, in California, Proposition 22, if you all are following, uh, which unfortunately- We are not, so you have to explain that to the Dutch that, audience. That, that is one of the attempts of the share economy, the gig economy, to actually enter into collective bargaining in a real way. It was saying that Lyft and Uber could not define their drivers as contractors, but has to define them as employees. And thereby, they become um, they become subject to labor laws where they can collectively organize. And this uh, initiative didn't make it, right? No, Uber and Lyft successfully exactly. uh, campaigned against this. So I think kind of uh, Democratic Party lending its power, prestige, organization, whatever it has to offer uh, to labor activists who are trying to sort of make this happen even if people in Uber and Lyft and their friends at Google are complaining, uh, would I think do a lot to kind of not to strengthen a part of the party that needs to be stronger if the whole thing is going to hold together and to kind of develop, redevelop this muscle that's been lost, uh, as we said, over decades, decades and decades. That's what the Democratic Party did in the 30s, supporting unions and supporting the labor class. It doesn't do that anymore at all. Yeah, pretty good. I know. I know. Do you see a real opportunity for this path forward for the Democrats? Is there enough support for that? I mean, you see people like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, kind of the progressive wing of the party, really hungering for this. Um, you see centrists uh, and moderates sort of, you know, thinking of it as an existential threat against the party you know, like the way Barack Obama weighed in against, you know, Bernie Sanders so decisively uh, in the primary. So I think there are a lot of structural, uh, structural obstacles to this happening. Uh, but, but we do see uh, a new undercurrent, a sort of stretching of the imagination and a new appreciation and understanding of American history. You know, like you see young people talking about Eugene B. Debs, you're talking about socialism, talking about things that happened in the 20s and 30s. Uh, in a way that they didn't used to. So I think we are coming out, the youth of America at least, are coming out of kind of a Cold War funk where they are more accepting and open to general social democratic ideas. The musical uh, Hamilton also helped uh, get uh, younger people interested in history. Did it? Yeah. Uh, it, cer it certainly did. I I'm on team uh, Jefferson and not on team Hamilton. So, you know, I worry that we're training kids up on the wrong way. No, no, but absolutely. This was something where people hadn't really thought about the founding fathers as people who thought things, you know, that they're just people who are on your money. A and I, I do think this kind of uh, revival of Anderson history can only help in the U.S. where we don't have a grounding in it. Isn't it a bit of like older generation language to say the new generation will fix it? <laughs> Yeah, no, it sure is. And, you know, and, and it's funny because we talk about the new generation like it's one generation, even though there's many coming up. And I will say, as somebody who makes content, when you talk to millennials, it's not the same way you talk to Gen Z. They are very different people, very different aspirations and uh, very different, very different ways of communicating. And so I think, yeah, there, there, there is uh, a lot of a lot of overgeneralization, uh, but there also is a rise in participation of young people. And we saw a lot of that uh, yesterday and that's good because so often the mantra is young people don't come out, young people don't come out, even though in the US it's actually sometimes very hard uh, to vote, especially if you're young and you're, and you're not totally situated in an address. 
So we make it hard and then we shame people for it. And then we wonder why we have such low participation in our mm. process. We have uh, the New, New York, York Times. Times calling Wisconsin for Joe Biden, by the way. Somebody's clapping here. Good. Um, that one was thing, definitely very good news. Yeah. One thing we... should not have been that close. Yeah. One thing that's... Well, it didn't surprise me, but I've been watching it for a while. And um, uh, Donald Trump got a bite of the black vote, especially younger black men. How do you explain that? Because he asked for their vote. Yeah. Uh, you know, like it, it was people thought it was laughable when he was spending money advertising and doing events and, you know, just humbly asking for the black vote. But he did it and he got some people to say yes. And I think it's because part of the ritual in America, you know, and to why I think he's a good campaigner is you have to go and you have to ask people to vote for you. Uh, I think his message of what do you have to lose was probably more effective, you know, before people saw more of what they might have to lose. Yeah. But I do think that, you know, his visibility in pushing the social justice and prison reform things that he did was very canny of him. Again, you know, he's a good communicator. Uh, and I think he was seen to be asking. And I think a lot of, uh, especially black men, feel like they are taken advantage of by the Democratic Party. But the Democratic Party does not actually listen or particularly care if they are in the party And that Donald Trump's sort of more humble approach to it worked. Do you see a generational divide there too? Younger black men going for the wild card, which is Donald Trump and the older generation sort of I going with the same thing. Uh, that there's some of that, but it's also, I think, patterns uh, of voting. And especially in places like the South, uh, oftentimes when you're younger, you are more independent and you're not necessarily part of a church community and things like that who can sort of vote uh, in masses, um, like as, as a kind of collective activity in a, very, in a very cool way, but it's something that older folks do in the South that younger folks don't do as much. There's something else that I was wondering about. You see a lot of, I mean, the Democrat, the Republican Party, especially Donald Trump, actually reached out to this community, but to many communities, and they actually asked for their vote. I see a lot of grassroots activity doing the same thing on the Democratic side, progressive side, but they're not related to the party. Is that a correct observation? And like, what can a Democratic Party learn from that? And why are they not doing it? You know, I, I think part of it was some wrongheaded thinking in terms of how to set up this primary. Because you're talking about like outsider groups, insider groups, the ultimate thing to do is to have a great competitive primary where everyone runs a different kind of campaign and going for different voters or you have Marion Williamson talking to the Republican and independent housewives, and you have Andrew Yang talking to the math lovers of America. You know, you have this incredibly wide uh, group who then, when someone wins, they give your whole apparatus to the winner. Unfortunately, this time around, they were all given a different task, which was get a certain number of donations and a certain uh, and a, and, and hit two poll numbers and, and two different polls. And if you can do that, you get to go into the debates And then you're a real candidate and people are allowed to vote for you. So you had, instead of a primary, reaching out to different communities, maybe even finding some folks who are lower propensity voters, you had 20 candidates all doing the exact same thing, trying to get the most likely Democratic voters. And so it was left to other groups. And I would single out swing left in the U.S. as being one I think that's particularly impressive. Um, but left to other groups that are not the party to do basic voter registration and to do outreach. Um, I do want to give a shout out to the Bernie Sanders campaign, though, who I think very successfully started scaling up uh, what's called relational organizing, which is sort of automating ways that you, an individual, uh, can contact the 20 people you know best in your life. Because, you know, unlike calling a stranger where you may or may not be a good messenger, uh, when you call someone who you know and tell them that you're voting for Joe Biden, for instance, Uh, we know that this is a, a particularly effective thing. Which so I, I do think that was good. But no, in general, it's not happening the way it should. Do you see any progress there? I think you're going to see a lot more uh, pushing of relational organizing. Um, and you'll see some kind of, especially as Bernie Sanders probably isn't running for president again, kind of the talent pool that's built up in his uh, movement dispersing to other places. I think you already see that in folks like, Um, the Sun Sunrise Movement, who are very good in their creative, very quick in their organizing, and have been very successful. I think some of that is, is modeled on these other smarter, tighter, tighter organizational tools. 
Hmm. Is, was that an optimistic note to end with? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, why, why not? We, we kept it pretty cynical the whole time, so ending on a high note sounds all right to me. <laughs> Let's do that. Thank you so much, Arun. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Um, let's zoom out a little bit. Can I just add yes, this little uh, news tidbit? Uh, oh, it's news. I'm news, sorry. I didn't news get News flash. Democrat Joe Biden has gotten more votes than anyone who has ever run for president. That doesn't mean he will become president, <laughs> but he has gotten these votes. He's up to 69.9 million votes as of uh, just a few minutes ago. I dare to challenge the statement that he got more votes because these might actually be more votes against Donald Trump than votes for Joe Biden. If you catch my drift. And a yeah, but that may come down to the same thing in the long run. And the wonderful the thing run. about the American political system is that the guy who got the most votes is, in quite a lot of instances, not the guy who becomes the president. And again. Haven't we seen that before? Haven't we seen that in 2000? Haven't we seen that in 2016? Aren't we going to see it again this year? We conclude, we we conclude after all these all these conversations, we concluded that one of the main problems is the American political system. Yes, we did. But you can only change the American political system by changing the constitution. And do you really believe in in changing the constitution in the United States can in the next done? few years? Nobody believes that. Nobody believes that. Not in the next four years, but I think this is a question that we can discuss with our next panelist who just got on. Th uh, welcome to you both. Russell Shorto, writer, journalist, and former director of the John Adams, a very familiar face, as is George Packer, staff writer at The Atlantic and author. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, let's start with the state of mind of the both of you. George, do you want to start? Well, it it kind of oscillates every uh, 15 minutes or so. Last <laughs> night, uh, I was sinking into a deep gloom as um, the count in Florida and then in a bunch of other states seemed to be going against Biden. And um, it wasn't just a close election. It seemed to be a losing election. But um, I think that was deceptive because a lot of those, the, the missing votes were Biden votes coming in late as absentee ballots, and that's what's being counted today. And now it looks, I haven't checked in the last hour, but it looks pretty good. Uh, so in a just sheer horse race, um, you know, I'll, my stomach is uh, churning all the time, and I, um, I won't sleep well tonight as I did last night. Um, my, if Biden wins, I have a deeper dark feeling about, or if he loses, it doesn't matter. The, the election shows something about us as a country that is uh, very hard to face, but hard to escape. Um, I don't want to cut into Russell's time, so I'll just leave it at that and we can talk about it as we go on. That's quite a cliffhanger. cliffhanger. <laughs> we'll get back to you, don't worry. Uh, Russell, uh, what's your state of mind? Uh, well, first of all, it's nice to see you all. Nice to virtually be in Amsterdam. And it's an honor to share the screen with George Packer. I've admired his work for so many years. Um, my state of mind, I, I guess, is mainly sadness because uh, I had hoped, as I was listening to most of uh, your, your previous guests, uh, except for about 20 minutes, I had to run and pick up my son from school. But... Um, uh, so I share that sense of sadness and frustration. I had, maybe not right in the forefront of my mind, but somewhere in my mind, I had uh, held out this hope that um, four years of, of mayhem and illegality and shattering of norms and children in cages and all the rest would have made some portion of, uh, some significant portion of Republicans um, say, you know what, this, this, is, this is not the American experiment and I still want to participate in the American experiment. Uh, and that doesn't seem to have been the case. Uh, so that's a, a huge um, loss because it now means not only, I mean, whoever uh, ultimately wins, um, the future is a mess. Um, George Packer wrote a 
wonderful book called The Unwinding about, um, about uh, America in our lifetime and this slowly uh, unraveling society. And I think from now forward, it's maybe the dissolution. I mean, because you're gonna have these two wild animals locked in a cage together and, and uh, you know, what, what possible good out, this, this kind of dovetails with the point he ended on, what possible uh, good outcome can we expect from this? We have entered the sequel of The Unwinding. Yeah. George. Thank, thank you for that, Russell. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. I think Russell put it really well. Um, we are a, it's, it's almost euphemistic to say we're a divided country. I think mm -hmm. we're two countries who um, don't understand one another, hate each other, um, want to see the other suffer and lose, uh, don't uh, care about the well-being of the other, and can't, can't grasp what could possibly motivate the other to do what it does. Um, I'm in one America, and so I look at the, you know, the tens of millions of votes that Trump got, and I share Russell's just sense of horror and, and resignation at how you've seen him for four years now. He's a threat to democracy. He's actually gone pretty far along the road to destroying democracy. He'll go a lot farther in a second term. Do you not care about our democracy? Have you given up on it? Do you, do you, have you got a, another attachment to him? And what is that about? So it's a failure of, of, of comprehension to some degree on the part of people like us who uh, look at Trump and cannot imagine how he could have this much support. Um, but his support is so real. That's the, the truth that's come of this election. 2016 was not a fluke. It wasn't Putin who gave us Trump. It was we who gave us Trump. And his popular vote will be greater this year than it was in 2016. Uh, and it will also be more diverse. It seems pretty clear that it's going to be, it's going to have substantial minorities of Latino and even black votes, mostly men. Um, the races are incredibly competitive all over the country, from Nevada to Maine to Wisconsin to North Carolina, just very, very tight. So he's got broad appeal, um, and th his followers are living in a different world from mine, and that's, that's really alarming because it's in some ways harder to figure out how to solve that than to solve uh, infrastructure or global warming or taxes. It's, this is a, a existential and epistemological um, collapse that, that and, and for me, the thing I keep coming back to is, don't you care about our democracy? This is all we've got. This is the thing that has kept us going and that has been a model to the world and that has kept us together when we had nothing else in common and now you're throwing it out. Do you understand the consequences of that? Your president wants to subvert this vote. He wants to stop the counting. He wants to take the vote away from people. He wants to do anything he can. Does that not concern you? And I don't hear that coming from anyone except never Trumpers who are a kind of a vocal minority of Republicans who've gone the other way. So we are stuck with each other we can't live apart. We can't live together. Um, that's the message of this election. Um, and it's been true for some time, but I think fantasies can, can arise that the other side may eventually start to fade away, that we have the majority, that we have virtue, that in some ways right will prevail, and it's not working that way. Instead, we're just, yeah, we are two caged animals in the same cage. Um, and it's, I don't know if there's any precedent. Russell, can you think of one for how a country divided as we are goes on together without a civil war or without um, breaking apart like Czechoslovakia in a peaceful way? Is there any precedent for what could happen? Well, Maybe, I think... Yeah. Just, uh, excuse me, Russell, because there's actually a question coming in about a possible civil war. So we might 
uh, response to uh, George's remarks about whether do people really care, Yvonne Sonderop, if the US is two countries now, can journalists only speak to one of the two peoples? Uh, that, that's a challenge to speak to both. I think the, the civil war notion is, um, uh, or starting four years ago, that really entered my head that uh, this is in effect a civil war. Um, uh, the, the obvious difference between now and the American Civil War of the 1860s is that there was a convenient, if you want to use that word, geographical divide then, uh, and that doesn't exist now. So I'm kind of, over the course of the day, you started by asking how we're feeling, um, been thinking of this larger and more defiant um, Republican uh, vote for Trump as, in effect, declaring a civil war, saying, you know, we don't care that he violated norms, violated, uh, has violated laws, has been nakedly uh, corrupt. Uh, we're, we're, at, we're after you, and uh, that's what matters. And th we can't do it on a battlefield, so we're doing it this way. It, it sounds a little bit, but maybe that's just the sentiment of today, that the both of you have given up. <laughs> well, I, if I can... Um, I, uh, one of my naive hopes uh, was that if um, Biden won uh, a large victory and the Democrats took the Senate, then they might be in a position to, I mean, as George was saying, there are, um, uh, there are a host of reasons that people vote for Trump in spite of the, these, the, these glaring faults. Um, and... Some of them are good reasons. Uh, both parties have failed a lot of uh, a lot of America, and um, if there had been this kind of supermajority, then that might have given the Democrats um, an opportunity to maybe a little bit like what Bernie Sanders was doing to open up to uh, white working class men and say, we want you in this tent. Uh, we see the, 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 these outrageous flaws in, in American capitalism, and we're working to change it. We want you on the team, and we want to you know, restructure this together. So somehow, out of all of this, maybe uh, you know, it seems unlikely that that's going to happen uh, in January, starting in January, but, but, but somehow in the future, I think that underlying reality has to be addressed. And then maybe you can start to talk about uh, people who aren't uh, just two warring uh, camps, but really, but simply two parties who both uh, see value in, in, in the same system and look at it as the same system. Yeah, I, I agree, Russell. I, I, if Biden had the power to govern, which would require a Democratic Senate majority, um, his platform and agenda are pretty um, ambitious, even sweeping, and address some of the very issues that um, fueled the the discontent that produced Trump. Um, but if he doesn't have a Senate, and if I mean, if he if he wins the presidency, but there's no Democratic Senate, it will be um, just pure obstruction, which Mitch McConnell knows how to do very well. And instead of some broadly popular economic program that can at least begin to show people that government can actually work uh, on their behalf to make life better, instead we'll have endless little blow-ups of the culture wars, which are symbolic and which take the place of actual policy and programs. And the culture wars are a bad place for Democrats to be. Um, they divide the de Democrats among each other, and they also divide the country and play into the hands of, I mean, Trump has used them throughout his four years. So my worry is that if it's a divided government, <clears throat> um, we're going to see more symbolic politics, more culture war, and 
um, more division with white men becoming more and more Republican. Um, I, that's why the Senate is so important. Right now, it doesn't look so good for the Democrats. Um, but that would have been, for me, one way through this 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 nightmare is is for a progressive administration to actually be able to govern we and to begin to address common problems, which Biden has laid out in, in his in his platform. Martin? Yeah, I've been thinking of a terrible solution. Wouldn't it be the best for the United States a second Donald Trump term, making things even worse than they are, a kind of a Lendung's policy? Because when th there must be some point somewhere in the future where a majority of Americans realize that things have been going completely wrong in their country, that, that, that the United States has derailed in a very fundamental way. So isn't it then a, a kind of solution? It's, it's, a, it's a solution from despair uh, to give Trump another term and, and let him fail even more completely than he has failed in his fir first four years. And Trump himself has already also referred to a third term. Well, maybe a third term. I'm quite free in it. Uh, well, because you both have a very bleak vision. And I completely agree when the Senate is Republican, the next four years nothing will happen. It's, it's just uh, lying still in the water. From, from the well, I, yeah. I, um, the problem for the, that has been clear throughout these past four years, which I have been frustrated that Democrats have not seemed to fully want to, to see, uh, is that, I mean, we're talking about Mitch McConnell and, and Trump, obviously, um, violating norms uh, in, for example, uh, the method of blocking Obama's uh, Supreme Court nominee and then uh, shoving down the throats of the country, the uh, Trump Supreme Court nominee under the same circumstances. Um, that's just one example of if you're, if you are, two people playing a game, the game has rules. And if one team decides it's not going to abide by the rules, you don't have a game anymore. And the Democrats keep acting as though, all we have to do is, is get smarter about how we play the game and you know we've got a chance. Uh, but if the other side doesn't want to play that game anymore, if it has torn up the rules, what in the world do you do? Can I answer the proposal that a second Trump term would um, enlighten the American people. Um, the first Trump term has culminated with very nearly half of Americans voting to give him a second term. During the past year, 230 or 240,000 Americans have died of COVID. Our economy has collapsed. Unemployment went up to the 30% at one point. It's now down to 8%, which is still incredibly high. Uh, we had a summer of protests and riots. It was the worst year in maybe in my lifetime. And Trump is very close to getting reelected. So I don't think another four years is going to convince anyone of anything that they don't want to be convinced of. I think I, are yeah. not, we have to try something because... It, well, let's not try that. That should be... That, that, should be. I, I, that one I'm just going to say right off the bat is not, is not a good idea. But George, can um, I Let's find yeah. some other ideas. If I frame it from the perspective of, of, of many activists that I've spoken to, they tell me if Biden is the president and Kamala Harris is the vice president, we're just going to pretend that racism is going to be addressed. If Trump is getting another presidency, he basically um, uh, made the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, movement visible. He made it visible how racially divided we are, how white supremacy is still a power. So if you frame it from that perspective, what they say is just let it explode, let it get worse because that's the only way it can get better. Can you um, understand that's, that that's perspective? A, that's a, that's a, d a dangerous fantasy because when they say let it get worse, what do they mean? How many people do they want to see killed? How many businesses do they want to see burned before the vast majority of Americans suddenly wake up and say, gee, we live in a racist country. We should throw this guy out and have another president. It just doesn't work that way. The idea that the worse, the worse, the better, which was a slogan in the late 60s of the new left, 
it was a disastrous idea for the new left when Tom Hayden said that he wanted George Wallace to win in 1968 because the worse the better. Well, we got Richard Nixon and we got a huge conservative backlash for for years and years. In some ways, we're still living with it. Um, it's, it will not be different this time. So, no, Biden and Harris are the sane alternative. They will not give the activists all that they want, but they will take steps toward police reform, toward investment in black communities, toward improvements in spending on education that may not satisfy self-described revolutionaries who think that we're going to have a completely new country if, if we can only make things as bad as possible for the country that we actually have. But it would be progress. And progress is something the people, the American people need to see or else they'll completely give up on government and, and on one another. Um, one of the, among the many things that need to be addressed, uh, how to do it is another question. Um, education. Uh, your earlier panel was talking about uh, how, um, how ignorant Americans are of their system, of how it works, of their history. Um, in the past 30 or 40 years, uh, in addition to that, we've seen uh, the basic units of society, uh, small towns, families, uh, uh, collapse. And in the wake of that, there's this alienation. And so people are forming these new, new groups or, or reaching out for, for alternatives. Um, and they don't have that kind of historical underpinning. They don't have that sense of what the founding fathers did and what the country has, has gone through. Um, so some kind of coming together as a group, as one people, uh, with common principles, with, that, with, with common goals of rebuilding a kind of civic yeah. culture is something that I think is hopeful that I, don't, I have no idea how to achieve it, but how could both sides not value something like that? Yeah. We have a, a, a not so much a question, but a remark in the same vein from uh, uh, Mark Ove in our audience. He says, Biden will also have the opportunity to run a transformative pres presidency, not so much in lawmaking, but in pulling the country together again and hand it over to the next generation. Is that the best possible scenario? I think a Biden presidency would be a good thing in many ways. That's one of them. I mean, the president as we've learned by the negative example of Trump, is a very powerful person. Biden could immediately change the tone of politics coming from the top. He could lower the temperature. He could speak to the whole country. He could treat the American people with respect and dignity and model a kind of respect that Americans have stopped showing each other. And perhaps it could gradually begin to seep into um, into the country and into the way Americans talk to each other. Um, he would show a different face to the world. That might be the most important change he could make of all if, the, if Congress, if the Senate remains Republican. He could show to the world that we want to cooperate, we want to be a good citizen, we want to lead, we want to um, be involved in collective efforts to solve problems. Where America first is over, and America as a good world citizen and a leader of democracies is back. That's something a president can do without a whole lot of congressional um, involvement and something I know Biden would do because that's just in his nature. That's the way he sees the world. Um, and he could also speak in the way he's spoken throughout the campaign. I think he's run a very good campaign because he has spoken both passionately about problems racial, economic, climate, and yet unifyingly about us, about who we are as a people. And he won't be able to heal these divisions, but at least we will no longer have the incredibly destructive daily noise coming from the White House that we've had to live with for the last four years. And I think that would just have a, a kind of calming effect on the country. This is a very different uh, view of the role of the Democrats from that expressed here by Barbara Harrison. She says, part of why some of my family members voted Trump was that they hated what the Democratic Party has come to mean. They feel that the Democratic Party is a threat to democracy. Perhaps this goes back to the deplorables, which none of us will ever forget. 
Can you understand this sentiment, George? I'd like to hear how it's a threat to democracy. If, yeah. if she means that there's an illiberal tendency on the left in universities, in the media, and in the Democratic Party, she's right. There is an illiberal tendency. Um, I've written about it. I've spoken about it. Um, does it dominate the Democratic Party? Is it Joe Biden? No. The illiberal tendencies in the Republican Party are the president, the, the leader of the Republican Party. Biden has resisted it. For example, when he was asked, you know, do you believe in getting rid of monuments of slaveholders? He said, we should have it done in by a procedure so that the authorities and the public get to have a say, and it's not just done by mobs. But in general, Confederate general sh monuments should not be in public. But American presidents who did good things should not be torn down. That was a totally sane, balanced response that no one really even noticed because it was so sane. That's the kind of thing that Biden, I think, would be able to do. These hot button cultural issues, he just by instinct will diffuse them. He will downplay them. He will not poke fingers in the sensitivities of people who fear that the Democrats will impose some kind of illiberal majority rule and force other people to live exactly like them. There are Democrats who have that tendency, but Biden is not one of them. And I think he'll have um, a much more, as I said, a much more soothing effect um, than and maybe any of his opponents in the Democratic primary. Uh, I could just follow up on that. Um, a few days ago, I was uh, on uh, Bautohoff, and also on the panel was Ayan Hirsi Ali. And she um, made this unusual argument, I thought, that it was probably not a good idea to vote for Biden because there is this illiberal left. And if he got in, they might be in charge. And my counter to that was essentially what George was saying. Well, the illiberal right is already there. They are in charge for sure. Why assume that a moderate Democrat is going to automatically be, be uh, uh, under the sway of uh, the extreme wing of his party? Gentlemen, we are approaching the end and I would, it's against the bluesy tide that we're in right now, but I would like to ask you if there is a silver, silver lining in your view in whatever we're looking at right now? There is. First of all, in spite of Trump's every effort to rig this election and to intimidate people from voting, we're going to have the highest number of votes cast in any presidential election in our history with just incredible turnout in some parts of the country. And that is a testament to Americans abiding belief that their vote matters, that really it's all they've got in a way, and they're not going to give it up easily. So that to me is whoever they voted for, the fact that they voted um, gives me some hope, um, as does the fact that even though Trump's numbers are much higher than we expected or than I want, um, it looks like Joe Biden is making inroads into some of Trump's areas. And for every American who has voted to me appallingly to keep Trump, at least one other American has voted to get rid of him. And that's why we're divided, but it's also why there's, uh, for me at least, um, lots of flickers, even stronger than flickers of life left in our democracy because people voted like their lives depended on it. This was the most urgent, intense election I've ever seen. And it, it's because Americans have seen what four years of Trump uh, have done to the country and that at least they are engaged. Russell, a silver lining to end with? Uh, yeah, just to follow up on that, um, I think that uh, the the way we, the attention that has been brought to bear on the system and on politics through these four years and in the course of this one election um, is maybe an occasion for the kind of civic re-education that, that we need to bring about to, uh, 
to to move forward, to move into a future in which uh, we can kind of come to a new appreciation of the founding documents, of the bodies of case law, you know, all this this um, this foundation of material on which uh, this this country has rested, in which we've we fear we've seen shredded in the past four years, um, but uh, the. Thing that Trump brought about then is kind of a, a certain amount of awakening. And um, uh, where we go from here is anybody's guess. I, you know, I think one last thing is, uh, this is literally the morning after, the day after. And uh, so we're all dazed, you know, assuming we move into a, a, a assuming, let's, it's a big assumption, but assuming Biden becomes president in January, um, there, there are all kinds of opportunities for reinventing, for being creative, for taking what we've got, if it's divided government, if it's horribly divided country, and looking at it in a new way. Thank you so much, both of you. Russell Shorto, George Packer, for sharing your precious time and your thoughts, and good luck in the upcoming days and weeks. And my closing remarks, my silver lining for yes. today. Uh, my own private silver lining is that no matter what the outcome of these amazing elections will be, there is still something like the John Adams Institute, <laughs> which will continue to bring the best and the brightest of American thinking, hopefully of both ilks, to the Netherlands. And I'm very glad that a center like this that fosters discussion and debate and um, thoughtful, thoughtful reflection exists. Uh, and in that same vein, I wanted to tell you about our next upcoming event is on December 1st at four in the afternoon. It will be an online conversation by Roberta Haar of the University of Maastricht with Ian Burema, who will be in New York, on his new book, uh, The Churchill Complex. Thank you all for joining us. My apologies to the members of the audience who posed questions that we didn't have time for. I hope you understand. Thank you to those of you who uh, uh, braved the pandemic to be here with us this evening. Thank you to the Public Library of Amsterdam, the OBA, uh, for hosting us and for working with us on our program series. See you back on December 1st, and thanks again. Good night.